we have come to another month. This today is May, May when? May 6th. Uh, in April, we had a wonderful series. We called it the Topical uh, April. And for those who are familiar with the Baptist, we get hold of a book and we dig deep most of the times. But in April, we considered various, uh, various topics that were generated from the congregation. Now, we want to get into the book of Second Timothy uh, this month. It has only the four chapters, and we shall be going through it systematically through the month. You remember, our theme is what this year? Destined for greatness. And when we are destined for greatness, there are some things that we need to continue doing, especially starting with one another in discipling and in mentoring. Because part of our greatness before God, in the presence of God, is the, num- is the trail of people that we leave behind. Is the number of people we have brought to the Lord. Is the number of people we have grown in faith in the Lord. It's a number of people we have encouraged to grow uh, in the Lord. And therefore, as we continue considering our, uh, our destiny to greatness, eh, I want th- us this month to consider the book of Second Timothy. Second Timothy. It's a wonderful book when it comes to discipleship and mentorship. It's a wonderful book when it comes to just showing us how practically to go about studying uh, with people. And the title I have given the entire book is Before I Die. Before I Die. I don't know whether any one of us has ever come close to that. You know, something happens that you think, oh my God, I'm going to die. And what went through your mind? Do you have someone who takes to share a testimony of a time you thought you were going to die and what went through your time at that particular time? Do we have someone? Oh, we have been very safe. <laughs> Praise God. Yes, Dr. Mwangi. <laughs> Let's hear from Dr. Mwangi. He'll tell us what happened and what he thought at that particular time when he thought, oh my God, I can die. Or I could die as a result of this. Thank you. Um, I remember many, many incidences. But I'll go to the one that happened very recently. You remember Sarit Center last week? Is it? Friday. I was going about my businesses and I was in Sarit Center. And second floor, I was going to the pharmacy. There's a, 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 a shop, a um, shoe shop there. I just reached that position without knowing anything. And I could not see where I was going. I think the rest is Mm. history, because maybe you may have seen the pictures that Mm. came out of the incidents. The whole, at least the second floor, was filled with smoke and dust, and people were putting masks on their faces. And I was there. And what came to my mind is, it could have been my last. Mm -hmm. Because it could have happened when I was in the center of the blast. And I don't know what would have happened after that. So, yes, it can happen. It Mm -hmm. can happen. I missed the West Gate. This is another one. I have many others. Thank you. Wow. Wow. And by the way, even as we thank God for, for Dr. Mwangi, we also do thank God for our members who have businesses uh, in Sarita. At least I know of two. Maybe there could be others. But for those we have, their businesses uh, are secure. They didn't suffer loss, at least for the information that uh, we are getting from them. <clears throat> now, there's a time I visited a doctor. And the way this doctor diagnosed me, I thought I would die. I even started giving myself maybe one year, eight months, eight months to, to one year, from what I have had experienced from other people who had gotten what the doctor had suspected I have. Eh? And I remember that night, I couldn't sleep. 
I remember waking up at night and just go to the bedroom, bedroom of my two girls and kneeling down and touching them and telling God, please, please God, just allow me to bring these two girls you have given me up. And going back, in fact, I've never told my wife this, <laughs> going up <laughs> to the bed and stretching my head and touching my wife, oh my God, just give me the privilege of growing old with my wife. Not at this time. And you know sometimes, when we are faced with danger, what is closest to us comes to the service. It has a way of bringing what is within us, what we value most, what we treasure most, what you would be most fearful if we lost or if it was taken from us. And when we are talking about the second book, of Timothy. You see, it is many years now since Timothy, ah, since Paul rather, was caught on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. Many things have happened. When he was caught, we learned that he stayed for about 12 years in the desert of Arabia, maybe just so searching, meeting with the Lord, seeking God, maybe just reading scriptures. We do not know exactly what he was doing in the desert of Arabia, but about 12 years. You remember then he went to Antioch, when Barnabas went for him uh, uh, from the desert of Arabia and he ministered in Antioch and then one day the church in Antioch, they are praying, they are fasting, they are waiting on God and God says, uh, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the mission that I have set aside for them. And Paul just hit the mission field uh, running. First missionary journey, Asia Minor, uh, second missionary journey. You know I'm talking like this because we have finished reading the New Testament. So I, I know we have, you know, when I talk of the first missionary journey, I know you even know where it is in the book of Acts, where she went, the dabs, you know, those two cities. Eh? Then the second missionary journey, he manages even to cross to Europe, Philippi, eh, that's what it's called. Eh? The Salonica, Berea, and down there at, at Corinth. You, you know, at the end of that missionary journey. And then something happens. You remember in the second mission of journey, he's arrested and uh, put in jail in Philippi when he healed a servant's girl. And he is whipped. Then at night he is praying, he is fasting, he is worshipping God with the ciders and pop, the doors open and they are... Uh, since they didn't escape anyway, the jailer had them released the following, the following morning. Later on, after the third mission of journey, before he could go to, to Spain, because he had written a letter when he was in Corinth, if you remember reading the book of Romans, and telling the church at Rome that I'll be passing there on my way to Spain because now there's no more work left for me in Asia and this part of Europe. Now I want to go and spread the gospel where Christ has not been preached, but I'll be passing there in Rome so that you can help me on my way to Spain. But unfortunately, when he reached Jerusalem, after that, writing that letter in, 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 in Rome, uh, in uh, Corinth, he goes to Jerusalem to deliver the gift he had been collecting for the poor in Jerusalem. And unfortunately, he reaches Jerusalem, he is arrested. For two years, he is in jail in Jerusalem, where he got the opportunity to minister to people like Governor Festus, Governor Felix, and ultimately King Agrippa, where he appealed to go to, to Rome. And off to Rome, he goes, you remember the shipwreck uh, in, in the ocean, he is almost, they are almost dying, but the angel comes and says, do not be afraid. Nobody is going to die in this ship because of you, Paul, because you have to reach Rome. You have to testify about me in Rome, just as you have done in Asia, in the entire of Asia. And Dr. Luke leaves us as in, at the closure of, of the book of Acts with Paul in a house arrest, where even if he is restricted, he is able to preach, he is able to reach out to those who were in Rome. By the end, Paul had covered over 16,000 kilometers. That is far. And most of it was on feet, just spreading the gospel. And he had suffered a lot. He had been stoned. He had been persecuted. Anyway, we shall be reading about that in chapter 3 of this, uh, of this book. But when he's writing the book of 
Second, Timothy. He, he was released from that imprisonment in Rome, and he got another chance to travel. In fact, one of his disciples, Clement, who later became the bishop of Rome, tells us that actually Paul managed to reach Spain once he was released from that first imprisonment in Rome. He was able to reach all the way to Spain. Some believe he is the one who started even some churches, very early churches in, in Britain, and his disciples started churches in North Africa. Remember before Islam, North Africa was quite a Christian, Christian world. So indeed, he did a lot, this servant, this servant of God. But when you read the book of 2 Timothy, Paul once again is in jail. And something is different. Something is different this time. You remember when we read the book of Philippians, in his first jail term in Rome, he says, I'm not very sure whether I will be released or I will be killed, but I'm convinced you need more. You need me more at this particular time. And so convinced of that, I know I will leave. But this time in 2 Timothy, because again he is in jail in Rome, something is different when you read this book. He is saying, my time is up. I'm already being poured out. I have finished the race. It is a done deal. And he almost says that he is telling his disciple Timothy, before I die, there are some things I would want you to know. Because my time for departure has come. My time for departure has come. Around this time, what had happened is that Emperor Nero had burnt Rome. He, he wanted an opportunity, he wanted a, a reason as to why he would persecute believers. He had burnt Rome and blamed it on Christians. And so he is arresting Christians, right, left, center. Some he is, uh, he, he is burning in his palace to write the palace. Others he is crucifying upside down like Peter. And some like Paul, who are Roman citizens, were to die the more dignified, less painful death of being beheaded. And so, Paul seems to know that my time, my time is up. And what does he do at that particular time? When he knows that my time is up. When he knows, when you read this book, I'm not even very sure whether by winter I'll be alive. Because he's telling Timothy, please come, make sure you arrive here before, before winter. He's not even very sure whether he is going to be there in winter. But what does he do at that particular time? He writes his most personal letter to one of his most trusted spiritual son in the name of Timothy. And that is the letter we have today we call Second Timothy. Second Timothy. And so I have titled this letter then for the purpose of this month series, Before I Die. Because he is sure he is going to die. That one is certain. And chapter one, which we are going to be considering today, when we look at it, we are going to look at it under the banner of fan to flame. Fan to flame. Before I die, I want you to fan to flame the gift that you have received. So very quickly, let's look at chapter one of this under the banner of fan to flame. And why does he want Paul, uh, Timothy, to, learn, to fan to flame? What he's saying is one, we are called. It's because one, we are called. Two, we are gifted. One, we are called. Two, we are gifted. Three, we are required. We are called. We are gifted. We are required. So, fun to flame. Fun to flame because we are called. Fun to flame because we are gifted. Fun to flame 
Because we are required, we are obligated, we are duty bound to do some things as a result of the fact that we are called, we are gifted, then we are duty bound in one area or another. One of the things you observe in this chapter is that Paul was still very confident about his calling. And this is significant. We may take it as if Paul has always been an apostle. He has always been a believer. But when you read this book, you actually realize that people were departing from faith. People were denying their faith so that, so that they could escape persecution, so that they could escape death. People were denying the faith. But here Paul says, he still refers to himself as an apostle of Christ. These were days when it was not fashionable to associate yourself with Christ. But Paul still clings to his calling. I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is still clear about his calling. He is still clear about his relationship with God. He is still very clear who called him at the mandate that he was given. He is, his, his circumstances his circumstances do not blur his calling. He's still very clear about his calling. And he's almost telling his son, when I am gone, make sure your calling is never in doubt. He's almost telling him also, when I am gone, even as you continue leading that church at Ephesus, make sure those who are caught Hold unto it tightly because that is what will sustain them. He doesn't mention the church in Antioch which introduced him to the ministry of the missions. He doesn't mention them. Instead, he says, I'm still an apostle. I am still set aside. Yes, I'm in this dungeon. And by the way, it was a very small underground cell with like a very small hole for light and air. But even there, and you learn that he was still shamed, even when he was there, he was shamed. But he is not ashamed of the gospel. In fact, the next thing he's very clear is that God saved us through his gospel. He's telling his son, through the gospel, he saved us and called us to holiness, to a holy living, to a holy living. These are the things that he wants Timothy to hold on to tightly. That we have been called to a holy living. If we are discipling people, and we are hoping that by the end of this month, <coughs> perhaps by the, end of <coughs> yeah, by the end of this month, we shall all be settled in our, in our vine groups. But the whole issue of holy living, holy living, we are trusting God that we shall be able to learn about holy living because this is what Paul is telling uh, Timothy. And he's telling Timothy, you know this gospel that we are talking about? God initiated it before the beginning of the time. Before Genesis. Before God created moon and stars and the season. Before there was time. In other words, the gospel through which we have been called is not an afterthought. It was not because Adam fell. It is not because in the Old Testament Israel fell. It is not because anything happened. It is the plan of, it is the original plan of God. There are people who believe, thank you, dear. <coughs> sorry, I'm coughing. You know, there are people who believe that the Old Testament was a failure. The nation of Israel failed. And the plans of God, as far as Israel was concerned, did not materialize. But what Timothy, what Timothy is being told, this gospel that we hold on to, it is not an afterthought. It is not because the, your forefathers failed. This is the original plan of God. Long before time began, long before the world began, Jesus was there, and it was the plan of God to save the world through Jesus Christ. And so Paul declares, I am therefore not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the shames. 
I'm not ashamed of my circumstance. I'm not ashamed of jail. I'm not ashamed of the current circumstances because even in the current circumstances, I know whom I have believed. A very strong verse in this chapter. I know whom I have believed. And I know that he is able. I know he is able to keep that which I have committed until that day. I may not be very sure about winter. I may not be very sure about next year. I may not be very sure whether you even find me alive. But there's one thing I know. That the one I have believed is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. Until another of a song, you remember I sang that song, and I believe Kaiser will be leading us in that song as we give our tithe and offer to him. Because you know, when we are not sure of our calling, when we are not sure of our calling, it is very easy to be ashamed of some things. You know when you hear the kind of money that Mr. Bio is talking about, it's very easy to be ashamed. Hi, yo, yo ni jinki. It's very easy. It's very easy to feel ashamed. But Paul says, I am not ashamed because I know the one I have believed. I know the one who called me. I know the one who, it is so clear in my mind who called me. And I know he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. Against that day. So I am not ashamed. The next thing he tells him, as he tells him to fan, to frame, is that we are gifted. We are gifted. This chapter opens with Paul in prayer. And one of the things he is urging Timothy is to fan to flame the gift that Timothy received when he laid his hands on him. Perhaps it was during his ordination. Perhaps it's the day maybe he was commissioned to lead the church in, in Ephesus. We do not know at what particular time that Paul laid his hands on Timothy. But he chose him fan to flame. Because the spirit that God gave us eh, is, not a, is not a spirit of timidity. It's not a spirit of timidity. It's a spirit of power. It's a spirit of love. It's a spirit of self discipline. So what do you do? Fan to flame. I believe we have all at one point or another used the three stones to light fire. The firewood. Anybody who has never used firewood here? You know, yeah. oh, Bill, sorry. Oh, quite a number. Then you have never lit fire. Eh? Yes. Of course, we are in the city. There are some people <laughs> who may not have experienced this. But let me tell you, Bill, when you're lighting fire using firewood, the one thing you need to do is to fan. <laughs> when you're writing the jiko, the chaco jiko, the one thing you need to do is to fan to flame. Is to fan. And this is what Timothy is being told to do. Is what Timothy is being told to do. You see, Timothy was not like his spiritual dad. Paul was very brief. Paul was very abrasive. Paul was such a choleric. He could go anywhere. He could talk to anyone. You remember King Agrippa when he's prison, in prison in Jerusalem. And Paul witnesses when he's given an opportunity to talk or to defend himself. Instead, he shares the gospel with King Agrippa. And in fact, he gives King Agrippa an opportunity to get saved. And the king, so surprised, looks at him and says, Paul, do you think within such a short time? You can make me a Christian. And Paul says, short or long time, I pray that you can be like me, but without the chains. There's somebody in prison telling the king. You know, he could do those kind of things. But Timothy, Timothy seemed to have been a timid young man. Sometimes even fearful. When he's writing the first letter of Corinthians, he tells the people in Corinth, eh, when Timothy comes, 
See to it that he has nothing to fear. You know, don't, make it, don't frighten him. Don't frighten the young man. See to it. You know, treat him in such a way that he has nothing to fear. But now, when he is dying, he is telling him, before I die, I want you to find to frame that gift. And you know, most of us are like Timothy. Most of us are like Timothy. Most of us are so gifted, but we are timid. Most of us are so gifted in matters ministry, but we are fearful. We need to write a letter to NBC Westlands. When Mr. Karaoke comes in front of you, see to it he has nothing to fear. You know, when Joseph goes to quarry, I hope you didn't take fear there. See to it that he has nothing to fear. You know, in this instance, Timothy is told, fun to flame. And I think this is a good thing for us. It's a challenge for us. Because there are many ministry opportunities that we miss because we are timid. You don't know what people will say. I have never spoken before people. I have never done this. I have never preached. Perhaps you tell me to share a meditation. That's what people say when you tell them to preach. Perhaps you tell me to share a devotion. But preaching, no. I have never led someone to Christ. Where do I start? I have never, I have never, you, you know, believers we are, many times, we are, not because we are not gifted. God has gifted us. God has, and he has given us his spirit. And Paul says, this spirit that God has given us is not a spirit of timidity. It's a spirit of power. It's a spirit of love. It's a spirit of self-discipline. It's a spirit of self-discipline. You know, I think it was just yesterday I was being told of, I can't remember, someone else who has been preaching somewhere and insulting people. So it's not that kind of spirit where you insult people. But it's a spirit of self-discipline. It's a spirit that can enable you to discipline yourself. You know, and that's the thing that Paul wishes for his son, that you'll be able to find to flame. In this place, because God does not gift anyone with all the gifts. I don't have all the gifts here. Mr. Gatia does not have all the gifts there are in the scriptures. But you can be sure, in this congregation, all the gifts that the Holy Spirit can give to a church, he has given us. But there are some which we are not utilizing, eh? Because we are timid. Because we are fearing what people will say. And so Paul says, see to it that you find to frame. See to it. But you know, there's a way in which it is good to be a bit timid. There's a way in which it is advantageous to be a bit fearful. I remember when I started preaching, uh, I think the day Pastor Gishiga gave me an opportunity to preach, I was so fearful that I went, I told my mentor, I don't know what to do. I have been asked to preach. I am so fearful. And I remember him telling me, eh, you know, Erastas, I, have been so, I would have been so surprised at the fearful of you if you came and told me you are feeling very encouraged, you are feeling very happy, you are feeling very prepared that you are going to preach. You know, Oswald Shebas said this about the people like you are dying. That God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human power and resources or the abandonment of reliance on them. All through history, God has chosen to use nobodies because their unusual dependence on him made it possible for the unique display of his power and grace. He only chose to use somebody's only when they renounced dependence on their natural abilities and resources. Let me tell you, people who are timid, people who are sometimes fearful, like Timothy, can be leather in the mission field, can be leather when it comes to ministry. They can achieve so much, and they do achieve so much 
Because God does not like using, God does not use those who are full of self-confidence. Those who think they can do so much. Those who think, you know what? I am so gifted. I am so gifted. That worship team, I'll be able to take it far, 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 far up, given my gifting. Or that preaching ministry, I'll be able to burst the ceiling. Given a, those are not the kind of people that God uses. God uses those who sometimes think, oh my God, what will I do? How can I lead a Bible study group? How can I lead a vine group? Those are the people that God uses because they have an unusual dependence on him. That's what Oswald Shebas said. And that was Timothy for you. And that is most of us here today. I cannot imagine start even telling you how fearful I am. I was telling the prayer team at Mrs. Karanja on that day. Every Sunday morning. It's the day I wake up the earliest. Like today I woke up at three. And between three and four, I was just telling the Lord, now how can it be that it is me again to stand? You know how fearful I am. You know how I am not gifted to do? And it is true. It is true. I am a fearful person. Me, even when the boys were going on strike in school, I used to go to the headmaster's house. And I told him now, me, I don't know, me, I'm not part of them. <laughs> yes, you hear Musaliti. Somebody has said, I was called that, Musaliti. You know? But God likes using those that are fearful. Those who are not feeling confident. And I want to encourage you, if you are here and you are feeling not very confident, a bit fearful, not very sure of your gifting, fan to frame. There is a gift you received when you got saved. There is a gift you have received when people have prayed on you. When Mel told us to hold one another's heart and just pray for each other. And it is not the first time, it is not the second time. There's like a gift that God has deposited in you. Which is that gift? Spare it. Fan it. Fan it to frame. And Paul gives an example of three of the gifts that he thinks, he, not he thinks, that he knew he had. He said the first one, Kerus. Preacher. He was a preacher. He said, these are my gifts. That's what he's telling them. He's telling him, I'm an apostles sent with a specific commission from God. And I'm also a teacher. And you know what he's saying? Eh? And this is a good thing about our relationship with God. Eh? When God called me using this gospel, or through this gospel, I was appointed. You know, when God calls, he appoints. He appoints. Those of you who have ever received a promotion in the office, one of the things you really want to receive after you have been told of promotion is the appointment letter. Sometimes the motivation is you want to see how much your bank, you know, is going to change. But, but you want to be sure that I have this position. Those of you who have ever done uh, interviews and you are waiting for that appointment letter, Paul is saying, eh, mine, when God called me, he appointed. He appointed. He appointed me into three offices. Sometimes you can have one gift. Other times, it can be a multiple of gifts. But each one of us is gifted. We all have gifts. But out of these gifts, we are required. We are duty about. We are mandated. God does not call a gift just for the sake of it. And these are the things that Paul wants Timothy to be so clear about. Even as you minister to this, this church in Ephesus, make sure these are the things you are preaching to them. Make sure that people know they are called. And those are the things we need, we need to be teaching in our, in our vine groups. They're asking people, do you know what are your, what are your spirit, spiritual gifts? So that if you, realize, if you realize you are leading a group of five people, and none of them know their spiritual gifts, eh? you can even first stop doing the study you are doing. Eh? First, 
engage in a study that places people where they are gifted, in the areas that they are gifted. But we are required, and I just learn, run through this because of time. We are required. And one of the things that Paul hints here about our, the requirement is the requirement to be fruitful. The requirement to be fruitful. You, you know, the utilization of our gifts helps us, makes us to be fruitful. He calls Timothy, my son. He calls him my son. Now, that's not a simple title. You know, my dad would come every evening holding some goodies, and we are there as children, we are calling him daddy, 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 daddy. And he used to tell us, the title daddy is very expensive. And you know, I, now these days I know it. Hmm? Because him, he had six, I have two. And I cannot fulfill the everything you call me daddy about. You know, it's an expensive title. And I think even in the spiritual world, by the time you have the confidence of calling someone my son, whom you have not given birth to, it talks of great investment in that person. By the time you're able to say my daughter to someone you have not given birth to, but you are calling her my daughter because of your relationship with them, and not because of age. You know, in Africa, we are, you know, if you are the same age with my mother, you are my mother. No, I'm not talking of that kind of motherhood. You know, I'm talking of where it is as a result of spiritual deposits that you have put in that person. You, you, you know, uh, the lady who was here two weeks ago, Irene Togoy, the kind of deposit she has put in my wife, when she calls my wife my daughter, it is appropriate. It is very appropriate spiritual. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy. You are my son. In chapter 2, he ought to be telling him, eh, the things you have heard me say, and I think we covered that in February, and trust the faithful men who are able to, to teach others. So be fruitful. Be fruitful. If you have been caught, if you have been gifted, he wants this young man to be fruitful. And I urge you, let's be fruitful. As NBC Westerns, let's be fruitful. Because we have been caught and we have been gifted in a certain way. You know, the other thing Paul talks about here is prayer. Oh my God. He opens this book and reminds Timothy, or assures Timothy, I pray for you day and night, constantly. Now, Paul, <clears throat> when you read each letter he wrote to any church, one of the things he tells the church is, I pray for you without ceasing. And let me tell you, one of the ways you can know that you're on your way to getting a spiritual child is the amount of time you spend praying for that particular person. Not because they're in a problem. Not because they want visa. Not because they want to travel. Not even because they have lost someone. But because you want them to stand in their faith. If you have spent time on your knees calling upon the name of God because of someone you are involved in and all what you are asking God, please let him stand in his faith. Let him not fail. Reveal yourself to them more. You, you know, and you realize that Paul knew not just Timothy. He knew his mother. He knew his grandmother. He knew our believers. He knew the grandmother was a believer. He knew the mother was a believer. And he says, I thank God for this faith that you have, which first lived in your grandmother's loins, then through your mother, and now lives. He knew the family. He knew their family. One of the things that made my, <laughs> me to recommit myself to the Lord when I had left a bit is when the guy who was following me up 
drove all the way from Nairobi to Nyeri. I think I have told you that. And for me, it communicated something. Actually, this is serious. This is getting serious. He has come, he has eaten with my mother and my father. Now he knows my brothers, my sisters. You know, this is getting serious. There must be something. And I think we haven't known people until we have known where they have come from. And until they have known us in a very intimate way. And we shall see that in chapter 3. So Paul prayed and prayed. But the other thing that he tells him, stand tall. Stand tall. Don't go bedding. Stand tall. Now, this is very significant because this is a time that believers are being hunted. These are times that believers are being killed. But Paul tells his disciple, stand tall. Do not be ashamed of the testimony in the Lord, or of his gospel, or of me, his apostle, and his prisoner. Do not be ashamed. Start firm. Start tall. Let it be known that you are a believer. Don't hide. And he is going to give examples in this book of people who have found a way of hiding themselves. They don't want to associate with Paul at this particular time. But he is telling Timothy, start it all. Do not be ashamed. Do not denounce faith. Start firm. You know, there are many people who, I think because of that spirit of timidity, even their family members don't know they are believers. Where they work, nobody knows they are believers. Nobody knows they are believers. Where they live, nobody knows they are believers. Is it you, Dave, who gave us this illustration of a boy who was asked by someone to show a believer, to take him to a Christian home here? And the boy had been sent to a shop. And, you know, crossed several homes, then came back home, and the mother is asking the boy, where have you, you know, I just, the shop is just, where have you been? No, I met as someone who wanted to be, to be shown a home of a Christian. The mother is shocked. You don't know I'm a Christian? <laughs> Who do you think? But you know, but you know, that's how many times, sometimes people operate. I remember when I dedicated my life to the Lord, and I would go home and I find my buddies. Now what do I do? You know, they would, don't, they would want to buy for me one. <sighs> what do I tell them? You know, do I tell them I dedicated my life? It is not fashionable among the young people those days in the university. It's not fashionable to go saying, you know, now I'm saved, I'm born again, you know. You know, something I'm real. What, 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 what reason do I give? What reason do I give? Some of my family members, how do I tell them now I'm a believer? How do I refuse to do some? You, you know, but Paul tells Timothy, do not be ashamed. And this was not idle talk. This time, they were being arrested, they were being persecuted, they were being put to death. So he tells him, don't be cowed down. And finally, he tells him, guard the good deposit. Guard the good deposit. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because it is highlighted a lot in chapter 2. But in other words, whatever you have heard me say, keep as a pattern of teaching. What you have received, guard it. Do not let it evaporate. But the way he finishes, he finishes in a very interesting way. Because he gives him example of three people. One who have been able to start with him. And two, he highlights two. He says many people, in, especially in Asia, everyone has deserted me. But he picks on two. And these two are picked because most likely they were in leadership. Most likely they were very close to him. Most likely there were people he would have expected to stand. Some scholars believe that he had asked them to be witnesses in Rome, in the court, in Rome, and they refused because they do not want to be associated with him. They do not want to be associated with somebody who is a Christian. They do not want to be associated with someone whom the emperor has marked as a believer and who is about to be killed. But even in those hard times, there was still one guy 
who really stood with him. Really stood with him. Really stood with him. And did not deny, deny him. But when he was in Rome, he really looked for him. He refreshed him. And even when he was in Asia, Paul says, he really refreshed us when we worked in Ephesus. So the things that Paul is highlighting here are things that you would want the young Timothy to have in mind, to grow in himself, and as we shall be learning in chapter 2, to others, not just for himself. It is about teaching others. Things to do with the gospel, things to do with the prayers, things about fruitfulness, things about standing tall and being courageous and not walking, bedding down as if you are excusing yourself, but standing tall because the one you have believed, the one we have believed is able, is able to keep that which we have committed to him against that day. Let the worship team come. Let the worship team come as we pray. Our Father, we are before you this morning because again we are reminded of your goodness, of your mercy, your love to us, O oh Lord. We are thankful to, to you because you have called us. We are thankful to you because you have gifted us, O oh Lord. We are thankful to you even for what you have called us to or require of us in this relationship that you have given us with you. So we do thank you and bless your name and exhort you, O oh Lord, even over the things that you are learning, O oh Father. We are here as your children and you know us because there is nothing that is hidden uh, from you, O oh Lord. You know in the areas in which we are so timid. You know the areas, O oh Lord, that sometimes we are not able to identify with the gospel, O oh Lord. Maybe there are even some areas we are ashamed, O oh Lord. But this morning you are reminding us that we should not be ashamed of the gospel, O oh Father. We should not be ashamed of you. Because you are able to keep that which we have committed to you against that day, O oh Lord. As I really do pray for each one of us. I pray that we shall be strengthened. I pray that we shall rise up and fan to flame the gifts that we have received from the Lord. I pray that we shall allow ourselves to be fruitful in the, in, in the ministry. I pray that God will use us in the lives of other people. Because that is why we have been called, to be a blessing to other people. I pray that we as Nairobi Baptist Church Westlands, we shall have many children, people we can address as sons and daughters, not because biologically we are related to them, but because of the deposits we have put in them, because of the deposits that we have entrusted to them, because of the relationship that we have, we have had with them, because we led them to the Lord, because we have helped them to grow in the Lord and to know the Lord even more, because we have converted them from being docile Christians to being very productive and active Christians. So I really do thank you, Lord, even as I commit all of us unto your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray and believe.